Flat Earth Clues, Part 5, The Status Quo. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue covers the inevitable and sometimes frustrating question of why the authority would go to all the trouble of hiding the flat earth. My hope here is to show you different angles and a progression of events, all of which lead to a very changed world, both physically and mentally. To open, we have to go way back to when the world was a much more simple place. You had your five major religions, including Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Each of these groups had their own version of what is known in Genesis as the firmament, or the flat circular world enclosed by a solid dome-like barrier from where the Creator, or Creators, looked on. I'm not going to explore all the subtle differences between the groups. Suffice it to say that it's interesting that despite their differences that led to acts of horrible violence between them, there was no real Earth model debate. So around 500 years ago, the science community, led by Copernicus, who probably had a little help, introduced what we now know as the heliocentric, or globe model, of the world which in turn changed the solar system, galaxy, and so on. The religions, seeing that this globe model was gaining popularity, feared a loss in the fan base, so they all adapted their religion to include the globe model. From their point of view, it was a small change from a circular to a globe world, and really, in a few generations, who would remember anyway? So the churches, mosques, temples, wrapped up their flat earth model in a metaphoric soft cloth, and put it in the drawer with the good silver for safekeeping. Remember this, because we'll come back to it later. And hundreds of years went by, with science promoting all the aspects of the globe, and the religions promoting their beliefs upon this globe. The world kept spinning, so to speak, and everyone was happy. Then in the early part of the 1900s, you get this pesky explorer named Richard Byrd. He has family money, all the right connections, and secures basically unlimited funding and the government green light to probe every piece of unseen territory there is. It was inevitable, I guess. A young man who has an unquenchable desire to see all that there is to see, and then granting him the tools needed to accomplish this goal. He pulls a Truman and gets lucky, crossing the vast salt ocean, avoiding the icebergs, arriving at the frozen coastline, and he keeps going. He was never going to stop. One day, after crossing hundreds of miles of high-altitude ice and snow, Admiral Byrd sees it. A barrier. And to him, it's just a barrier, not THE barrier. He is but a tiny speck in front of it. It stretches out on both sides as far as he can see, and straight up so far that he can't discover the beginning of the arc. The great explorer now has a new challenge finding the shape of this thing. It's much like a blind man describing it the elephant. Until you feel out the whole thing, what do you really know? If you look at the AE, or Flat Earth Overhead Map, you see the problem. To even determine the scope of the outer wall, you have to circle it. It would have taken months, if not years. You could use a series of ships going in opposite directions, or planes, but there are refueling stations that need to be built and so on. His task was challenging, to say the least. Admiral Byrd kept laying the groundwork of the Great Discovery until his eventual death in 1957. A year later, the United States and Russia found the Upper Edge. From there, the math was easy. And moreover, you could actually see the real world. Then, of course, there is the decision, or deception, depending on how you looked at it. The authority made the call to hide the actual shape of where we live then sealed off the outer edge from prying eyes, and created the space program not only to reinforce the globe model, but to control it. There was really only one reason they cared about this, and it takes a while to process. So let's look at the immediate effects of actual disclosure and work our way up to the authority's biggest fear. For this exercise, we'll look at releasing the news today, instead of, say, 1958. 
While 1958 would have been easier, it's much more relevant and entertaining to explain it in modern terms. We start with a press conference by, let's say, the United Nations, who have discovered that the world is indeed enclosed in a giant high-tech dome of unknown origin and age. The public reacts with wonder and awe, trying to take in the sheer scope of this announcement. Facebook crashes, Twitter crashes, entire mobile networks crash. It's like hitting a beehive with a sledgehammer. News organizations around the world send teams to the outer edge to confirm the finding, and the general public is glued to their media devices. That's the good news, the excitement, the revelation, the positive shock. Then the bad news starts coming in waves, some of which you might not expect. The first is the immediate disbanding of NASA and all other world space programs, for obvious reasons. Most governments will secretly pardon these groups and keep them immune from class action lawsuits. The lawsuits themselves coming from NASA investment groups, claiming fraud. Regardless, everyone at NASA, despite their good intentions, is out of a job overnight. And this is where you would say, good, they deserve it. About time they stopped lying to everyone. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. Because every contractor and subcontractor that are exclusively tied to NASA, they have to shut down as well. Fine. A few thousand jobs lost. No big deal. And the ripples continue to spread, some bigger than others. Observatories all over the world close their doors. And the reasoning is this. If you've been looking at the ceiling for decades and couldn't tell it was a ceiling, then what good are you? Every university in the world that has an astronomy or astrophysics program, well, they don't anymore. Stephen Hawking? His book writing days are over. Carl Sagan? No more Nova in syndication, I guarantee it. Those professors are going to have to retool their skills and be prepared to answer one giant question. How did you not see it? Weren't there clues? People start finger-pointing, and it will continue for years. And still my fellow Flat Earthers will say, Well, hell, that doesn't sound too bad. So some nerds around the world lose their jobs. So what? Eh, you don't get off that easy, is what? The finger-pointing at the now-defunct NASA will then turn to finger-pointing at the government who directed the whole thing. This is where we run into some dangerous ground, involving things like the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and the Ring of Power. And you say, you lost me. I was with you until you started bringing up religious artifacts from movies. And you're supposed to be lost. Of the five major religions we mentioned earlier, those being Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, None have been able to produce a supernatural object over the last 5,000 years. And trust me, it would be beneficial to do so. The Ark of the Covenant would benefit Judaism, the Holy Grail Christianity, and the Ring of Power, well, that benefits someone else. Maybe I'll leave alone for now. The point is that all religions are actively seeking their leverage against science. You've heard of the division between church and state. Well, here it is. Advantage Church the barrier becomes a giant religious symbol, and since it is backed by the Big Five, it also becomes universal. The Big Five then go into their drawer with the good silver and pull out this belief that was forgotten but not lost and say, we knew it all along, and science lied to us. Temporarily, all religions unite against science, who has been only moderately weakened by the removal of their astronomy and astrophysics divisions. But the public won't care, because they will listen to the group shouting the loudest, and no one yells louder than the church. They will scream with righteous fury that the dome was built by our God, your God, and the people will turn to science and hear nothing but crickets. And that's where the world changes, because in times of great stress, the public will want words, and while religion has no shortage of them, science simply is incapable of taking leaps of faith. I'll take a glass-half-full approach 
and say that anyone listening to this is probably an intelligent, rational person, one who can make informed decisions outside of the conventional doctrine. But for every one of you, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of mouth-breathing troglodytes who will not walk but run to the respective house of religion and say, you were right about this. What else can you teach me? This is what fills the current authority with pause. The unknown response to that question. Will religion take the high road and work with what remains of science to discover the truth? It's possible, I suppose. It's also possible that religion will combine this technologically advanced society with a revitalized and aggressive doctrine that then transforms daily life into something that makes the book 1984 seem like a Saturday morning cartoon show. I'm hoping that mankind will prove me wrong, but so far, that isn't the case. So do some of your own research and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631.